culture of Jews from Arab country, countries um, is the culture I grew up with. My parents are Iraqi. Uh, they migrated to Israel where I was born and then to London where I grew up, or to England where I grew up rather. And um, so I had uh, that culture in my home. You know, there was always um, oriental music and oriental cuisine. Um, my parents spoke Arabic to each other. Um, there was always lots of parables and phrases that we'd hear, you know, for which there was never um, an English equivalent. Um, and when I got to Israel, um, when I started visiting again as an adult, and by that stage I was also a journalist, it seemed really obvious to me that, that something there was something amiss about the status of, of what's known as Mizrahi Jews. In Israel, they have a weakened socio-economic status. Um, their culture seems to have less value. It's not part of the mainstream Israeli cultural identity. Um, and that mismatch between what I knew from what my home and what I saw in Israel created this curiosity that, that uh, drove the book. And the book, Not the Enemy. Yeah. Um, what, 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 What's the argument in a nutshell? Well, it was the, the result of an argument with the publishers, you mean, the title. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. Um, well, the argument is that uh, the Jews that came from Arab countries, um, Mizrahi Jews in Israel, they are the majority. It's really easy to forget that they're the majority in Israel. Um, that's something that's not known necessarily outside of Israel definitely not amongst people who are not part of the diaspora Jewish communities. Um, I don't think you can understand Israel's relations to the Middle East, to its neighbours in the Arab world, unless you understand its relations with its own Middle East, East and South, with its own Mizrahi Jews, and that's really the argument of the book. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, this was something that I heard again and again in, in Israel um, from everyone, not just campaigners or people with an agenda necessarily, you know, just people in ordinary conversation who will say, you know, um, I was embarrassed when my parents spoke Arabic, I told them not to speak Arabic outside the house or if my friends came round. Um, you know, and some people of the first generation report, you know, they'd be speaking Arabic in public places and people go, shh. And they'd be like, what do you mean, shh, what, what am I, a horse? You know, why are you telling me to shut up? I'm, I'm asking my friend how to get to the, you know, to the security office or to some... I need directions of what language I'm gonna, am I going to speak to my friend in, if not in Arabic. But it became marked. Um, I think for my parents it was more just that thing of being migrants to Britain in the 70s and... Um, wanting their children to, to belong and assimilate and get on. Yeah, I think there's two things that are unique to that. In, in one sense, you're absolutely right that it is the classic migrant situation of um, people wanting to absorb the dominant codes of the culture in which they're in, in order to belong and get ahead. Um, the difference, of course, in Israel is that everyone's a migrant apart from the Palestinians. Um, and you want to question why the minority culture in Israel became dominant over the majority culture, which was uh, Judeo-Arabic. Um, so that's one thing. And, and secondly, of course, is that Arabic is a language of, of what's perceived as the enemy in Israel. So it has a particular stigma attached to it um, that makes it a lot harder for people to um, express their language, their culture, their identity. Um, in a country that is so opposed to all aspects of that and certainly doesn't want it to come to represent the Jewish state. No, I think it's definitely a resurgence and um, it's, it's, I suppose, um, for me, for me, it was partly this thing of I felt like I didn't have something that should I should have. Um, you know, I felt not entitlement. That's not necessarily the right word, but something that belonged to me, the Arabic language, that was somehow taken away or 
I took it away, whatever. Anyway, I, I need it back. And also, I'm, I'm a journalist, so, um, you know, I'd like to be able to interview people in Arabic as I interview them in Hebrew, because I think it's really important. Um, it's very, I mean, it's very positive. I think, you know, if I go into the West Bank and speak my appalling Arabic, people are, 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 are delighted, actually, because as there would be in any country where you try to speak the language, it's like, oh, she's made an effort. You know, people tend to respond to that very well, especially from, you know, English speakers who arrogantly assume that they don't need to learn any other language. And, you know, I, I include myself in that scathing analysis. But um, no, it is something that you see in Israel. Um, and, I, and I would say here, I would add to or expand what Professor Somecha said, is that I don't think you need to be um, Arab in origin or Mizrahi in origin to be an Arab Jew. Um, I think Arab Jew is, is, is a nice default position for Israelis to aspire to. And I meet plenty of Israelis who are from Ashkenazi backgrounds who learn Arabic and, you know, are immersed in um, Middle Eastern culture because, of course, once they have the language, this whole world opens up to them, which um, Israel knows nothing about. Um, Israel is completely oblivious to uh, the culture of the Middle East. I do, I do. I think that, that, of course, the conflict is about land, but it's also about culture and it's people's right to um, uh, express that culture in the Middle East. And I think, you know, if Israel wants to be in the Middle East, then it should be in the Middle East. And that involves in engagement, a cultural uh, uh, collaboration with its, with its neighbours that, that I think will locate it and anchor it a lot better than is currently the case. Of course, there are political caveats to that, but I think um, that, that that is also true. Yeah, I think um, academies are really good in, at challenging a discourse. And I think, you know, the discourse at the moment is Arab or Jew. You can't be both. It's this polar opposite that's part of a apparently historical hatred between the two who are completely different and can never meet. And I think that academia is really good at just challenging. It's just saying, OK, well, what happens if we we uh, turn that terminology around. What happens if we break that binary? Um, what happens if we start using a different language to describe this? And I, I think um, that sort of conversation has its natural home in, in academia. Great, Shabi. Thank you very much. Thank you.